going to be going through it. Today we're, we're going to be going over the nature of sin. Last week, um, the week before, excuse me, we had talked about um, Satan, who Satan was. But before we get into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for allowing us to be here today to just sing praise unto you, have fellowship with one another, but also to feed off from your word today, Lord. I pray that you'll prepare our hearts for what you have. Put me aside and let every word that comes out of my mouth be of you and not of myself. And Lord, we pray for all the classes and services today, Lord, that your perfect will be done. And we'll give you all the glory for that in your name. Amen. Um, Last week, or the week before, we had talked about who Satan was. And, of course, Satan ain't, isn't that cartoon character that we see on TV all the time. Um, he, um, most people think that Satan was an angel, but um, Satan is a cherub. And if you read through Ezekiel, you'll get a full picture of um, just who Satan is. Um, he was a cherub that covered God's throne. Um, he had pipes and jewels built in, made into him. Beautiful, if you... Think about it, Satan was a beautiful creation. He used to reflect the glory of God back down onto the throne. And, and Satan is a very smart um, creature. And we know that as our walk here on this earth, in this flesh that we have, we are going to have to battle against him. But in Genesis chapter, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth Know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to making one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, um, we must acknowledge that Satan's a crafty, sneaky creation. He's always going to be there. He waits in the shadows to try to get you to fall. Waits just for that right opportunity. He knows when to strike. And he, he, Satan is very patient. Um, I wanted to... You have to realize one thing, that Satan can't make you sin. Eve took of that fruit of her own. You know, a lot of times we, people like to blame other things for why they do certain things. But nobody can make a person sin. They, they choose to do that themselves. Satan couldn't force Eve to eat that, that fruit. Eve did that of her own. Um, but what Satan can do is he can make suggestions and, um, and cast doubt upon the word of God. And that's what he did here. That's what he did to Eve. Um, we see that the fall came as a direct result of mishandling the words of God. The commandment in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16 was amended in, chapter, in Genesis 3, 2. And when Eve, um, with the word freely being removed. You know, if you look on, at your handout, the introduction on that says, Sin is introduced to man by the ability of Satan. The source of sin is questioning what God said, altering what God said, and then denying what God said. Um, as we just read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1 through 5 or 6. Um, all sin is transgression of the word of God. The very last warning God gives man concerning the sin which took place in the garden is in, turn back to Revelation chapter 22 for a second. You know, that's why you've got to be careful about reading um, other, other books. I don't call them Bibles that take out, the, um, take out words out of the Bible because it changes the whole meaning. And those other books would like to take Jesus Christ out of the, out of the Bible. And without Jesus Christ, there really is no Bible. But um, Revelation chapter 22, look down at verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this, 
in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy cities and from the things which are written in this book. That's just what Satan tries to do. He tries to get you to change the word of God. And we see where the freely was, was being removed. And the warning in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 was softened by um, changing that and, and changing surely to die to lest ye die. You know, those words are in there for a reason. Every single word is in there for a reason. When you start removing them, it starts changing the meanings of things. It wasn't lest ye die. It says you will surely die. And that's what Satan's a master of. Satan, the devil cast out upon the word of the Lord and, den and, and denied its truth in verse 5. But it seems that man and his wife were more than willing to ascend to this unbelief. That's why we've always got to be on guard. That's why we've always got to be in the Word of God. To know when Satan comes knocking at your door and, and tells you, whispers these things in your ears when you're in your down times or have gone through rough times, you know the truth. The problem is with Christians today is they don't know the truth anymore. They've got to be retaught. They've forgotten what they had learned. Beware of any man or woman who tells you the very words of God are not important as long as you have the general idea. Every word in this Bible is important. Or God wouldn't have put him in here. But some people will, will say, well, if you get the general idea, that's all you need to know. No, you need to know more than just the Lord died and shed his blood for you. That's the most important thing, yes. And accepting him as your Savior. But how are you to live your life now? There are um, guidelines for living your life. Throughout the last century, popular culture has taught it in movies and um, art, music, telev television, video games has transformed Satan into two, one of two forms. One is he's either this terrible creature that's um, taken souls to hell or, or he's this um, um, creature that is saving the world, if you think about that. Um, or he is set forth as a real power in the universe, despised and hated because he is, he is um, in some eyes, he is the true God and hope of mankind. This later view is spouted by young people who um, cry Satan rules. You know, and that's just what um, they're trying to promote in the schools today, is that Satan's the one that's going to save the world. And that's your Satanists. But Satan is always out there, and he's going to be whispering in your ears. He's going to want you to change the Word of God. Don't change the Word of God. It's important that when you're quoting Scripture to people, a lot of times I forget... Um, things so that's why I always uh, make sure I turn to the scripture to read it right so I don't misquote it but when you're quoting scripture make sure you're quoting the right scripture in every word of that scripture what, and what I wanted to go over today was the nature of sin what is sin all unrighteousness is sin turn to 1 John 5 17 unrighteousness is, is injustice a violation of divine law, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, or of the plain principles of justice and wickedness. Unri um, unrighteousness may consist of a single unjust act, but more generally, when applied to a person, it is donated as a habitual course of wickedness. Those sins that you do over and over and over. But in 1 John, look at um, verse 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is is a sin unto death. You know, all unrighteousness, sometimes people like to think that one little sin is um, not as bad as another. In God's eyes, sin is sin. It doesn't matter whether it's a lie or someone murdered somebody or anything like that. In God's eyes, it's all sin. But there are some sins, if you think about it, that are habitual, that just you do over and over and over and there's a sin unto death means that a certain sins will lead to your death. Look at what happened to Samson. Because he, he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he still did it anyways. He knew the things he was doing when he wasn't supposed to do. And the Lord had to take him home early. That's what happens to Christians at times when they know the law, they know the Bible, they know what they're supposed to be doing, but they choose not to do it. And, you know, you've got to remember everything we do is supposed to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we want to um, please this flesh all the time and continue to do those sins over and over and over, God may take you home early. I know most, a lot of times people don't think of things like that, but it's true. In Romans 8, 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if, ye, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We're supposed to put down all sin. 
When Satan comes to us and wants us to, to listen to wrong music, we need to put that down. When Satan comes to you and, and, and tries to get your eyes to wander, you need to put that down. It's unfortunate that a lot of good preachers seem to um, fall to sexual sins because they don't keep their eyes on the Lord. They start getting it on the flesh. If you live after the flesh, those people, Christians, that think it's all right to drink, but then later on wonder why their liver is shot and they're laying in a bed and they got to have and their kidneys are shot and got to have dialysis, and that those that are um, continue to um, that are saved continue to do drugs and wonder why their body's giving out on them, and they look terrible. You know, God's not mocked whatever what, whatsoever the man, so that shall he reap. You can't go against the law the rules and the laws of God and expect to get away with it. We're going to have to answer for it sooner or later. But sin is all unrighteousness. You could actually say that some people are taking, the, taking a shortcut home because of their sin. But anytime the Lord has to take you home early, you don't understand that there's consequences for that too. Maybe the Lord had certain people for you to witness to that only you could have gotten through. But because you wanted to please the flesh instead of glorify the Lord, all of a sudden those people are on their way to hell because um, God had to take you home early. There are times where God um, will bring other people along to witness to those people, but I'm, I'm certain at times that only you could have reached them. It's like when we go into the nursing home for two years, we try to talk to this one gentleman and he acted like he didn't understand us, um, didn't understand a word. And he would just sit, and sit there and stare straight ahead. But when Barb came in the one time with her dog, all of a sudden he just lit up and he started talking. He understood every word. But if Barb wasn't doing what she was supposed to and didn't go in that night, that gentleman may have never come to know the Lord. That gentleman ended up getting saved. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 22, the congregation always murmured against Moses and Aaron constantly. Numbers, um, if you read through Numbers 11, chapter 11, and verse 4, and 16 and 11. You know, too many Christians are out there always murmuring. You know, we're not supposed to murmur as Christians. Israel was never happy. They were always seemed to be miserable. They always wanted more and more and more. And, of course, that's the flesh talking there. We should be content with what we have. Are you content with what you have today? The Lord knows our needs. He gives us just what we need. He knows if we, what would make us fall, what would make us walk away from him. He doesn't give us that for a reason. But yet the flesh always says, I want more and more and more. And is never happy. And is always grumbling and complaining. And when you're grumbling and complaining about everything and everybody, that's not glorifying God, is it? But that's just what Israel did. They were always murmuring, complaining. They murmured against Aaron and Moses. And God started getting upset about that. Because the, what Aaron and Moses were telling Israel is what the Lord gave to them to tell the people. And yet they still murmured and complained. They were never satisfied. They weren't satisfied with the manna that the Lord provided. They wanted meat. Of course, that's when the quail were, the Lord gave them the quail. But even then they, weren't, they complained about that. Um, the word of the Lord is more than just right. If you think about that, um, look at, um, excuse me, in Psalms chapter 33 and verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. The word of the Lord is more than just right. If you, do you ever stop to think about that? Here in Psalms it says the word of the Lord is right. But also if you were to turn back to Psalms 119, it's also pure, too. God's word is pure, and when you get it into you, it'll help you that you don't, um, that you don't sin. Because the Holy Spirit can put you under conviction. It's always right, but it's also pure. Look at Psalms 119, verse 140. 140. The word is very pure, therefore thy servants loveth it. Do you love the word of God? Do you feed off it every day? It's pure. It's not just right, it's pure. 
It's also, it's eternal. So again, here in Psalms 119, look at verse 89. We always talk about how important it is to, re, to feed off the Word of God. And we're seeing, you'll see why here. It's eternal. Psalms 119, look at verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's eternal. You know, they may take this, people are trying to take your Bible away from you, but God's word is eternal. It will always get out there one way or the other. Um, it is also life-giving, John chapter 6. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 63. John 6, down verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The, re, the words of, that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And of course we know that it gives life to people because when they believe the word of God and they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, um, they get e um, eternal salvation. and They get to spend eternity in heaven. So it, does, it gives life. It changes, excuse me, it changes people. It's true from beginning to end. In Psalms 119, 106, it says, Thy word is true from beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The things that God tells us that will happen are going to happen. The judgments that Israel is going to have to face in the tribulation, different things are going to have to go through. God's judgments are always true, and he'll follow through on every judgment whether it's to the Jews or whether it's to the Christians that don't want to live right and want to transgress and sin all the time. It is incorruptible in 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It is incorruptible. It is able to save souls in James chapter 1. Turn back to, or turn to James chapter 1 and verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and of, of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to, to save your soul. You know, if no one told you about the Word of God and you didn't read about the Word of God, you would have never been put under conviction. That's why it's so important to, to be out there soul winning and doing what the Lord's called us to do because there's a lot of people out there that have never heard the Word of God before. They don't know that they're on their way to hell. They don't know that the Lord Jesus Christ can save them. But if you never get the Word of God out there, how can it save people? People don't know that they're doing wrong unless you show them or tell them. So it's, it's more than just the word of the Lord is right. It's pure, it's eternal, it's life-giving. It's true from beginning, from the beginning to the end. It's incorruptible, and it also saves souls. Sometimes we don't just take time to meditate upon things and think upon different things in the Bible. And then transgression of the law. We looked at the nature of sin, the transgression of the law in 1 John Chapter 3 and verse 4, Transg if you, um, in the dictionary, if you look it up, transgression means the act of passing over or beyond any law, rule, moral, duty, the violation of law or breach of command. You know, breach of command, people say, well, we're not military. In one aspect, we are. We're all um, called to be soldiers for the Lord. But any time the Lord is, in the New Testament, Paul preached there's different things that we're supposed to do as Christians. And any time that we don't do that, do what we're told to do, and we do the opposite, that's transgression of the law. We're not doing what the commands that God had gave us. God commands us to go out into the world. Our church, I'm thankful that we have good people that go out on visitation. We do the sign ministry. We're try, we go out into the neighborhood and we're trying to reach the lost people. But there's a lot of dead churches out there that don't do that. You know, every one of those commands in the Bible the Lord gives us, if you're not doing it, you're transgressing the law or the commands that the Lord has given us. 
1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgress, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that this flesh is wicked. We know that we're going to fight against that all the time. Our, the flesh. But are you following the commands that the Lord has given us for the um, Christians today? Are you pleasing yourself? Or are you out there in the world? Has Satan blinded you just like he did Eve? He's a master at that. That's why it's so important to keep on your armor every, every day. And you can't pick and choose because the part you decide not to do that day, that's, what the, that's where Satan's going to get in there. You don't keep your breastplate on and he's going to get the heart. There's a lot of people, that good Christians, that over the years they become cold or they've gotten to the point where they think that they arrived. You need to be careful. Knowing and not doing, and James, turn to James chapter 4. You know, knowing that you're supposed to, and not doing it, it's a sin. Knowing, to do, knowing what's right and wrong and, and not doing what is right is a sin. James chapter 4 and look in verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. There's not really much explanation that needs to be said on that. We know right from wrong. We know what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. And if you're not doing it, then you're sinning against God. We have different commands a Christian is supposed to do. We're not to, you know, forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You know, there's a reason. Do you ever stop to think, too, why there's a reason why we gather together, too? Because what happened to Eve? Eve was out there by herself. She was alone. And Satan attacked her. But when you're in a group, you always draw strength from each other. An athlete always does better when he has a crowd that he's performing for. We strengthen each other. Your thoughts are different. That's why you shouldn't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We help each other to grow. Iron sharpeneth iron. It's just sad people don't want to come together anymore. Another thing that is um, this transgression law is doing um, is doing, but from a wrong motive, other than faith. Turn to Romans fourteen, chapter fourteen. Look down at verse 14, 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And then again in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. That's why when we take communion, we always, um, the pastor always leaves time for people to check their hearts to see if there's anything in there that shouldn't be there. A lot of people take communion and really don't think nothing about it, but that's a serious thing. What is your motive for doing things? Is it because of faith? Romans 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Your faith will never grow if you're not in the word of God. If you're never listening to preaching or teaching, your faith will never grow. People may have enough faith to get saved, but after that they, they never um, do anything else. They trust the Lord to save them, but in their daily walk with, with the Lord, they don't have faith he'll take care of them. The Lord knows every need we have, whether it's finances or food, we need to make sure that everything we're doing, we're doing in faith. That God will take care of everything. He'll guide us. He'll lead us. A lot of times the Lord will ask you to do something too just to test your faith to see if you'll, you'll move towards it. A lot of, I've known different people, myself included, that the Lord has um, 
started out on deputation, but then that door closed. A lot of times I think those things like that are testing of the Lord to see if you have faith. You know, when you start doing stuff, you always, when the Lord asks you to do something, a lot of times we start questioning God. You sure, Lord? Just like Moses said, I, I'm not a good talker. The Lord gave him Aaron to help him. But the Lord knows what we need. Step out there on faith and do what the Lord's called you to do. The more you get into the Word of God, the more you listen to preaching, the more you see how God is, what God has done for other people. That's why on Thursday nights we were doing the testimonies of people. And that's an encouragement to see how the Lord has worked in people's lives and what He's done for them and where they were and where they are today. And without faith, they would have never been where they are today. No matter what happens to you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have to have faith that He'll take care of you, no matter what you're going through. It would have been easy for Paul to think that the Lord, or it would have been easy for Paul to have no faith and think the Lord wasn't going to take care of him when he was thrown into prison over and over and he was beaten. But Paul had faith. He knew the Lord, his life was in the Lord's hands. And his motives were right. Are your motives right? The second thing I wanted to look at today was um, how sin operates. It is deceitful. Satan never discusses the wages of sin. It is a bitter fruit or its damning effects on the, on the heart and life. Turn it back to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, or excuse me, Hebrews 3. Look down at verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, Satan loves to paint a good picture for you. He'll never paint the ending of it, though. He'll make things look really good. But he never shows you that the end of it. He always shows you that the grass is always greener on the other side, but we know that that's not true. He'll show you, well, for a man to, to step out on his wife, he'll show you that it's, it, it's good for the flesh, it makes you happy, but in, in the end it destroys the family and brings heartache and pain. Satan always pick, paints a good picture. Is he painting a good picture to you today about something in your life? Satan will never show you the end of it. Satan will always show you that sin is pleasant to look upon, desired to make one wise. Eve wanted to be wise. Satan knew just what he was doing when he approached Eve in the garden. If you ever think about that too, if you read through and it tells you how um, um, Satan appeared to Eve, and it wasn't natural, it wasn't a human shape. And you would have thought, unless all the animals were talking, Eve should have run. You know, when you see, uh, some say it was a lizard, some say, I believe he appeared to Eve as a serpent. And if you see a snake talking, I'd, I'd run the other way. It just, it, it just naturally doesn't seem right. But yet he was able to beguile Eve and make Eve, get Eve to fall. That's just what he does in your life today. He'll try to paint that perfect picture for you. But you have to look at the end, your actions, what will it do? Will it cause pain and heartache for your family, for you, for others, those around you? Hebrews um, 13 tells us, or chapter 3 and 13 tells, but exhort one another daily while, while it is called today. It is, um, look at Hebrews chapter 12. Well, one, for those who, um, 
Whosoever, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It says to set aside every weight, too, you know, and sins. There are sins in our lives that we need to, to um, ask the Lord to forgive us for them and give us the strength not to, re, not to continue to do them over and over, but there are weights, too. What's causing, and you have to think about in your life, take a look in your life today, what is causing you not to be here every day, every time the doors are open for preaching? What weight is keeping you? What's keeping you from going out on visitation? Those are weights that weigh a person down. Lay aside every weight, it says. What weight is keeping you from going out on the sign ministry or into the nursing homes or the good news club and, and trying to reach the children? Those are the weights that easily beset us. And those are the weights that we need to learn to put off. Hebrews chapter 12, again, look there in, in verse 1 again. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set it down at the right, and is set down at the right hand of God. Of the throne of God. Verse 3 For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses in verse 1. The idea is figurative, figurative, excuse me, as though the witness overheard, overhead completely covered, surrendered the saint, is about to run the race. He is encircled with witnesses, so he has no alibi to pretend that the race can't be run. You know, we, we'll give every excuse we can not to do things. That's another reason to, to um, gather together as Christians, because then you don't have an excuse not to do things. And we always come up with excuses why we can't do something for the Lord. That's why you encircle yourself with, with witnesses, people that are encourage you, strengthen you, Verse 2, and he further is encouraged to run it. Do the people you hang around with encourage you to run the race? As I mentioned earlier, athletes always do better when there's a crowd around, when they have spectators, than when it's solo. You always put forth more effort in a group. If you ever stop to think about that, that's true. Because you're a lot of time, that's why you've got to be careful of your motives too. Are you doing it just because you don't want people to you want people to think you're more spiritual than what you are? Or are you doing it because you really love the Lord? But when you're around the right people, they should encourage you. And it gives you strength. You know, sometimes I have to go out, um, out on visitation by myself when we don't have enough people. But you're always more bolder when you have somebody with you. Verse 2 again, and he further is encouraged to run it. Athletes always do better before spectators than solo. You always put forth more of an effort in a group. Have you ever watched when they launch the balloons here in Canton? And they're filling the balloon with hot air, and, and you have the ropes holding it down until it's ready, until it's full enough, and the sandbags are holding it down. But when they want to take off, they loose the ropes and the sand. That's what you need to do. You need to cut them ropes and let the sandbags go. Whatever hinders the ministry, whatever causes you to lose your burden for souls or prayer, whatever it takes, whatever takes up the time you should be spending in the, in the book has to go. Those are the things in our lives we need to learn to put down. We need to do away with them. Do you love souls as much as you did the day you got saved? You know, that's the, the, the happiness that we should always have. When you got saved, you were so happy and you wanted to do everything for the Lord. But then as time goes on, things start weighing you down. Ropes start holding you down. 
You need to cut all those ropes, let the sandbags go, and take off for the Lord. What's ever dragging you down, what's ever keeping you from doing more for the Lord, those weights you need to put aside, and you need to get rid of them. Second Timothy verse four, excuse me, chapter four and verse seven. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. Are you fighting a good fight today? Are you going to finish your course? He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy in chapter 2, and verse 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We're called to be a soldier for the Lord. Endure hardness. You know, this world is becoming so wicked and so many things that are starting to make people stray from the Lord and changing their hearts because they're not keeping their eyes on the Lord. They're not ready to, they're not willing to endure the hardness as a good soldier anymore. We as Christians need to toughen back up again. Verse 4 tells you that we shouldn't be entangling ourselves with the affairs of this life. But we do because we take our eyes off the Lord. It is powerful. In Proverbs 5, verse 22, says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of sin. When you let, um, once one yields to any sin, it has the power to captivate him and completely control his life. We talked... You've heard a message before, messages before, where people may have talked about a chain. And each time you sin, it puts another link on that chain, in that chain. And eventually it wraps around the whole body once and twice and three times, four times, and before you know it's completely wrapped around you. That's what sin will do to you. And Satan will completely wrap you up in that sin. And then before you know it, that sin is completely controlling your life. Unfortunately, it's sad. I've seen that in my own family. And that chain completely wrapped him up. And he completely walked away from God for years and years. Didn't want nothing to do with God anymore. After he was on fire for the Lord. Have you started building that chain, or is that chain completely wrapped around you? Is the weight of that chain keeping you from doing something for the Lord, or doing what you know is to be right? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. It is hurtful, Proverbs 8.36, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and all they that hate me love death. Romans chapter 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in closing there, the condemnation of the devil in 1 Timothy 3, 6 was the desire for a higher place that, than that given him by the, his creator. Satan wanted to be higher than God, his creator. The appeal to the woman in the garden was to follow this path. Humility before God will lead one to except one's, um, God's given pla- what God has given to us and the place he's given to us in this, in, this er- in this world right now. All attempts of the creator to advance apart from the, cre- from the, excuse me, for the creature to advance apart from the creator are acts of sin. 1 Timothy 3, 3 in chapter, verse 6, not a novice lest being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. And Isaiah 14, 13 for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the earth. Satan fell because he wanted to be higher than God. Wanted to be smarter, wiser. That's what Satan is doing to Christians today. He's deceiving them. They're seeking, people are seeking to be wise, but yet they're fools because they don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. 
When those weights start coming in and weighing you down more and more and more, you turn away from God and you start thinking more of yourself and you become prideful and you think you have some knowledge and wisdom. But without the Lord Jesus Christ in your daily walk, guiding you and leading you, you don't have any wisdom. Those weights that are besetting you, that are holding you down, weighing you down, you need to get rid of those. Start getting on fire for the Lord again. Those sins that Satan has sort of blinded you to over the years and you need to, that are habitual over and over and over, you need to take it to the Lord and ask, ask him to forgive you for that. And then ask you to give you the strength to keep from doing them again. I know we, we, we never like to talk about sin in our own lives because we like to think that we're perfect. But we need to take a, a count of ourselves daily with the Lord. Anything that's in there that shouldn't be there, get it out. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for your love, your grace, and your mercy that you show upon us. Lord, I pray that in our lives, in our daily walk with you, Lord, if there's anything that's keeping us from doing what you've called us to do that's weighing us down, I pray that we'll put those weights aside, throw them off, just like that hot air balloon that we may, that we may ascend, Lord. I just pray that they'll get the love again that they once had for you, Lord, and start doing what you've called them to do. I pray that they'll get a love for souls again, Lord, to, to picture every soul that they come across burning in hell, Lord, and try to witness to them and lead them to you, Lord. But Lord, I just pray that you'll also help us, those sins in our lives that we may be fighting with every day, Lord. I just pray that you'll give us the strength to overcome them. Lord, we're supposed to strive to be more like you each and every day, and we're not striving if we're continuing to fall to those same sins over and over, Lord. I just pray that you'll continue to guide us, lead us, help us to always keep our eyes on you, not of the things that entangle ourselves in the things of this, this world and the things going on around us, Lord. And Lord, we do thank you so much for everything you've done for us, and we'll give you all the glory for that in your name. Amen. There's coffee and snacks downstairs. Just make sure you're back up in time for the 1030 service.